wasn't uh, too long ago, maybe 150 years ago, that you know, around the world in 80 days was considered something that might be impossible to do. It was a challenge. Now you can go around the world in 80 hours fairly easily. And so in the 19th century, we, we talk about incubation period, the time between exposure to a bug and getting the symptoms of the infection. That's the incubation period. For many diseases, that incubation period is seven to 14 days. And you really couldn't get anywhere very far in seven to 14 days. So what would happen is you would have your infection before you reached your destination. And you would either survive it and not be infectious anymore, or you'd die from the infection. But you wouldn't bring that infection to the new continent or the new part of your continent because it just took so long to travel. Now you can be exposed to something today and be in many other parts of the world in the next five days before you develop any symptoms. So that is one of the things that has changed. And there are many, many more people in the world. We're, we're heading towards 7 billion people. Uh, back in 1850, there was only 250 million people in the entire world. Now there are getting close to 7 billion. So we have many, many more people. We have rapid travel. And many of those people are not spread out over the globe, but they're moving to cities. So now we have major cities in the developed and the developing world. And frequently they look like this because people are moving to the city. They can no longer sustain themselves in, in the rural areas. And they're moving to the cities and they're living under conditions like this around major cities. So there's now millions upon millions of people living in cities who never lived in cities before. And as we get into some examples, one of the important aspects of this is that they still go back and forth to their ancestral village. So they are still being exposed to things that even 50 years ago were happening in isolated areas. They're now bringing them back to crowded cities. So you can see the potential for transmission of infection, whether it's, it's sort of nice apartment blocks like in China or these favelas in South America. They're just congested, crowded places. And at the same time, to sustain these populations and to sustain commerce, there's widespread distribution of goods. Now, let me, this will give you a little preamble to our discussion of mosquito-borne disease. But you can imagine mosquitoes breeding in the puddles that are created on top of these containers, between these containers, on the decks of these ships. And these mosquitoes could be traveling all over the world uh, on, on these boats. So that's just one example how this plays in. But also, this, 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 these containers could be loaded with foods that might have been contaminated in the fields where they were harvested. So 50 years ago, most of what you ate came from within 50 miles of where you lived. Now your food comes from all over the world. Some of us in the room will remember when you couldn't get certain fruits and vegetables at certain times of the year because you know, they, it wasn't the season. There's no more seasons because you can get all your food from South America and from other parts of the world where they can be grown at other times of the year. So we have all this international commerce, all this international travel, 7 billion people, rapid travel. And on top of that, we have global climate change. 2014 was the warmest year on record in terms of the entire world. I remember last winter, it didn't seem that way. But on average, it was the, it was the warmest winter in history. And we've seen this trend over time. And, and the debate isn't that it's happening. The debate is what's causing it. So everybody agrees it's happening. The debate is about what's causing it. And that also means we're providing new environments for uh, vectors, for example. Ticks, mosquitoes are much more widespread, and they're moving with this changing climate. So now you go to parts of the world where malaria was not a threat 50 years ago, it's a threat now because of this changing climate. 
And most, of, most human diseases have a very close counterpart in the animal world. And it's estimated that 75% of human infections have an ultimate animal source. So we either get them from the animals, so-called zoonoses, or they evolve in animals and us together. So we acquire them ultimately from animal sources. So now, because of population changes, because of changes in agriculture, many, many more people are exposed to both domestic animals and to wild animals. And we can think about our own problems with tick-borne diseases like Lyme disease, babesiosis, anaplasmosis in the same way because we are in an environment with ticks that feed on mice that were not in our environment as, uh, as prevalently 50 years ago. So a lot has changed in the last 50 years. So let's talk about one of these infections very much in the news, and that's Ebola. Ebola virus is a filamentous virus, so it actually develops in these long strings, threads, phylos, threads. And um, this is a virus that was unknown until 1976. There was a related virus called Marburg that was developed, that was discovered or identified in 1967 as the first filovirus, but Ebola emerged in Africa in 1976 uh, in an outbreak in a village in rural Zaire at that time, now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, that was identified by WHO and was responded to by WHO and CDC. Prior to that, our only experience with a similar virus was in 1967, and that occurred in Europe where they imported African monkeys for research purposes to European laboratories and people got this unusual severe illness that was named Marburg because the first cases were in Marburg, Germany. And the Ebola virus is named after the Ebola River in Africa. It actually occurred in a village nearby, but they didn't want to stigmatize the village and call the virus a name after the village. They named it after the local river the Ebola River. And Peter Piot, who went on to become the uh, United Nations HIV AIDS, global AIDS person, was the leader of the team from CDC that investigated the Ebola outbreak in 76. And since 76, there have been multiple outbreaks of Ebola virus disease in Sudan. And that, that first one in Sudan was also in 76, essentially simultaneous with the outbreak in Congo, as well as Uganda, Gabon, and the uh, Republic of Congo. So most of what we know about Ebola comes from these 20 or so outbreaks that have occurred between 1976 and 2013, which is actually quite a bit because all of these were responded to in a concerted fashion. Once this was identified, systems were put in place to identify these outbreaks and to control them because it was recognized that such a severe illness on a massive scale could cause the kinds of things we've been seeing this year in West Africa. And then there was a, a small outbreak, a couple of cases of Ebola in South Africa, which became famous for Richard Preston's book, The Hot Zone, where people were going into a cave. Think about that cave and we'll get back, we'll get back to that. So there are actually five Ebola viruses. Uh, one that was identified in 76 in Zaire and has reoccurred in Congo. One that was identified in 76 in Sudan, the Sudan virus. Then there were two others, one Bugdabuyo in, um, in Uganda, which caused a minimal outbreak, not as severe as uh, other Ebola. And then Cote d'Ivoire uh, is a, a virus that was only identified in one veterinarian who was handling carcasses of monkeys and he didn't get any disease. So as far as we know, it doesn't cause actually human disease, but it causes infection. And the other example of that is Reston, which was an outbreak in Philippine research monkeys held in a facility in Reston, Virginia. It was an outbreak among the primates in the facility, 
I guess including the humans who were primates, the humans in the facility as well. But they didn't get sick. They just had antibody evidence of infection. So as far as we know, resin viruses in Ebola that doesn't cause disease compared to Ebola Zaire that causes the disease of frightening consequences. And now we've had these outbreaks in West Africa of, Zaire, of the Zaire strain. And this just reviews what I've said in terms of these outbreaks occurring. But these outbreaks have at most involved about 400 people in the most severe cases. And usually in the latter period, once identified, they can get under control in two months, something that did not happen in West Africa. And the mortality rate, as I indicated, is different for these different strains of Ebola. Now, the Ebola virus, like any other virus, has to get into a cell to cause infection. Viruses, they don't, they don't breathe, they don't digest, they don't walk, they don't do anything except infect cells. And to do that, they have to attach to the cell. The flu virus attaches to our respiratory cells and invades the body that way. The uh, HIV invades the immune cells by attaching to a specific protein on the surface of the immune cell. The Ebola virus can attach to many different kinds of cells. And because of its shape, it has a lot of opportunity to attach. It's not round. A round virus can only attach in one place, whereas the Ebola virus can attach in any of the places it touches, making it very infectious. And the, most, the, most, the place with the most receptors for Ebola virus is the lining of the eyelid, which you hear a lot about protecting the eyes from exposure to Ebola virus. But it can also attach to many, many different kinds of cells. The a HIV can only attach to the CD4 T lymphocyte. The, the flu virus can only attach to the airway cells in your airway. But the Ebola virus can attach to many different cells. And then it actually grows right out of the cell. These are the virus coming out of a cell after it infects the cell, reproduces itself, and then escapes from that cell, literally like grass growing in a field, coming right out. And it's taking with it the membrane of the cell. So it's what we call an enveloped virus. And that's important because although it's highly infectious, it's also highly vulnerable to drying and the environment and water and disinfectants. So it's not a very hardy virus. It's not like the norovirus that we get in the winter that can contaminate an area and cause outbreaks that seem to go on for quite a while. It's not that kind of virus. It's actually kind of a puny virus, but it's very infectious, so there's a balance there. The disease usually starts 3 to 12 days after the exposure to the virus. And very nonspecific, fever, muscle aches, um, there, there might be a little bit of um, sore throat, not very characteristic, fortunately, because we're in flu season now. We worry about that. Um, and then it gradually <coughs> gets worse. And you start seeing nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, and you start seeing the rash that comes with it, as well as reddening of the eyes and then the bleeding disorder that's associated with severe disease. One of the aspects of the current outbreak in West Africa is that there's not a lot of the bleeding part of it. It seems to be less common than in other outbreaks of Ebola virus disease. Does that mean uh, that people are not dying of it? Obviously, a lot of people are dying. The mortality rate is running 60 to 70 percent. But there's a lot of other ways this virus can kill you besides severe hemorrhage. And that includes a sepsis-like picture so you get like low blood pressure and severe illness. Or you can get simply dehydration and loss of sodium and other electrolytes in the blood from the diarrhea and vomiting. And that actually is a very important part of the mortality. 
and has been recognized now that we've re uh, brought people back with Ebola, that one of their major problems was fluid problems. And once those fluid problems got corrected, they did much better. And it's very hard to do that under the conditions where Ebola usually occurs, and they actually try to resuscitate people with oral rehydration fluids because they don't have access to uh, IV therapy at, at any level that would address this. The incubation period could go up to around 21 days. This goes further, but that's only because this is a mathematical model. It's just a nice picture. So 21 days is the outer limit of the recognized incubation period after exposure, but it's usually seven to 12 days. It could be as low as three days with a big exposure. And the early infection can be confused with a lot of other things. The hemorrhage, again, 50% classical, less that we're observing now. And people can die from a variety of causes that I didn't even mention because the virus can infect any organ in the body. So it can cause renal failure, hepatic failure, gastrointestinal hemorrhage is very characteristic. Uh, and the, the day six is like where you start to see the turning point. And if people are getting better after day six, they're going to survive, most likely. And if they're not, they're not going to survive. And the survival is related to how much virus is in the body. So if you have a lot of virus in your blood, your chances of surviving is much less than if you have less virus. And that has to do with your immune response. A robust early immune response is probably very valuable. And that's why they give people with Ebola the antibodies from people who recovered from Ebola. You heard about the vo people volunteering to have their blood drawn and their plasma, or, or their actually whole blood in Africa because they don't have the mechanisms to extract the plasma given to people with Ebola from people who have survived. And the symptoms don't come on all at once. It's the classically within the first seven days you get the headache, the fever, the muscle pains. Uh, and then between day five and seven, you start to see the nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So people aren't very infectious early on because the virus is in the fluids, and they're not generating a lot of fluids early on. Now the problem, unlike bloodborne pathogens like hepatitis viruses and like HIV, it's not just in the blood, it's in the stool, it's in the vomitus, it's in the urine, it's in the saliva, it's in the sweat, it's in the tears, the virus is everywhere. And that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to maintain infection control, especially in very difficult circumstances because the virus is everywhere in the body fluids. And this is sort of end stage, end stage Ebola. And the treatment is only supportive. There's no specific therapy. There are experimental treatments, including the antibodies that I was talking about, transfused blood or plasma. Uh, and then there are some experimental drugs that are being studied now. There's a lot of debate. How do you study these drugs? Can you actually give somebody a drug and a placebo and not treat this severe illness? Or is this such a challenge that you should just treat people with the drug because it might work? We had the same debates early on with HIV infection. There are a lot of parallels with HIV infection here that I, I'll probably note. But so that's a big debate now uh, on many levels. And there's some uh, exploration now of vaccines. Vaccines have been in the works for the last 20 years, but there was no financial incentive to develop them for a disease that occurred in sporadic outbreaks in rural parts of Africa with no resources um, no, no way even to deliver the vaccine. So there wasn't much going on. But now I think we're seeing vaccines being studied. And again, how do you study these vaccines? Do you take healthcare workers at risk of infection and give half of them vaccine and half of them placebo? Or do you give them all vaccine and see if they have less of a rate of infection than they did before you started using the vaccine? And the irony is they're doing such a good job of controlling at the moment that many of these studies probably won't really get off the ground if things keep going well. And we can't, we can't not want things to go well because this is such a devastating 
disease where it's occurring. Let me remind you, it's not a devastating disease in the United States. Sometimes we sometimes forget that. It's really not, even though it's taking up a large part of my time. That's, that's nothing compared to what people are going through in Africa. It's transmitted by blood and body fluids. And it's not transmitted by people who are harboring the virus but have no symptoms. That's important because then you can watch people for the onset of symptoms. And that's what we're doing with all these people who are traveling. Thousands of people now are being monitored or have been monitored. Hundreds are being monitored at the moment every day for 21 days to see if they develop symptoms after arriving from the, those countries. Now, a lot of those people are at no risk because they've had no exposure to Ebola except they were in those countries. When you actually work out the percent of the population in these countries that actually have had Ebola, it's like a hundred or a one hundredth of a percent or a thousandth of a percent. So we tend to think everybody going there must be exposed to Ebola, but there are millions of people who live there who are not exposed to Ebola. So, but we're monitoring every, everyone nonetheless. And one of the big problems is in many parts of Africa, there are funeral rituals of washing the body, touching the body, saying goodbye to the body directly by touching that can transmit this infection because the body has the virus. So in the fluids, not, well, in the fluids. Um, people really become more, much more infectious after day five when those fluids are being generated. In fact, early on in infection, you might not even find the virus in the blood. I actually find that hard to understand how people can be so sick and you can't find the virus in the blood, but that's the way it is. So sometimes if somebody's really at high risk and you really think they might have Ebola, the first blood test has to be followed by a second blood test. And the contamination of the personal protective equipment that the healthcare workers use is very important because it's wet contamination. But there's actually very little evidence that inanimate surfaces transmit the infection. Because as I said, it's very vulnerable to drying. Yeah, you know, you can put it on a surface with protein. You can scrape it off, bring it to the lab, and grow the virus. But you can do that with everything, including HIV. But we don't really believe you get HIV from things that people touch that aren't wet with blood, in, fact, in the case of HIV. But in the case of Ebola, really wet with secretions. So, I mean, there's a lot of reaction to Ebola. It's understandable, but it's not magical. It's not a magical infection, and we do understand how it's transmitted. So it's body fluids, objects contaminated with body fluids, especially sharps. A lot of the ways healthcare workers get it is sharp injuries and infected fruit bats and primates. So we'll get back to the role that they play. And if you look at all of these outbreaks in Africa where they were very well studied because these teams went in there within days of the outbreak being recognized, they found that on average about 15% of household contacts of Ebola cases get Ebola. As long, and the 85% who don't get Ebola are the ones who don't participate in the burial ritual and don't take care of the individual, don't provide direct care. So there's a people living in the house with an Ebola case. And these houses, I, I don't imagine they're, you know, large mansions, they're just huts. But yet, you don't see that transmission unless there's direct contact with the blood and body fluids. This, this, this factor surprises people. The other thing is we hear about those two nurses in Dallas that got Ebola from Mr. Duncan, but you don't get much follow-up over, uh, over 100 people who had direct contact, including medical contact with him and living with him who never developed Ebola. So again, we have to contextualize this. We have to put it in some perspective. Should we pay a lot of respect to this virus? Absolutely. You want to take every precaution possible. But again, it's not magical. So the, you have to sort of think of this as the risk of infection increasing with the illness of the source patient. So early on, there's probably very little risk. I, I've already said, because we've had issues around transportation, this, if I was monitoring somebody and they said, I just developed a fever, I would have no trouble going to pick them up in my car. 
you know, just for appearances, I'd have them sit in the back seat. But, you know, in driving them to the hospital, I don't really think I would be put at risk for that. And a simple cleaning of my car would more than suffice. Now, if I get a call and somebody who we didn't know about who was vomiting and having diarrhea and they're starting to bleed, that's a totally different circumstance that warrants a full PPE response. Now, all of these patients are going to get a full PPE response, and that's appropriate. But we just want that response to be balanced with the fact that so far, none of these patients, none of these people, except Mr. Duncan, have developed, and there have been thousands. Since the outbreak started, probably over 40,000 people from that part of the world. And only one developed Ebola as a result of that exposure. It wasn't a healthcare worker. So we've got to keep that perspective because people tend to overreact. So people actually won't, you know, won't go in an elevator because somebody who developed Ebola you know, two days before had been in the elevator two days before that. It's actually, these things are coming up and they're totally, they're making total, or the best example is the woman who went to Dallas for a meeting that was 10, 10 miles from the hospital where Mr. Duncan was. And when she went back to Maine, she wasn't allowed to go to work for three weeks and her daughter was kept out of school. That makes no sense whatsoever. She wasn't at risk of Ebola to begin with. And she, even if she was at risk, she wasn't symptomatic. So you can only get Ebola if you know somebody with Ebola. And that's what I ask all these people coming back. Do you know anybody with Ebola? No. Then you're not going to have Ebola. And there have been many situations where that discussion has led to these people getting medical care for their malaria, mostly, without sort of the big drama. You hear about the drama in the, on the, in the media, but some of these cases have happened. Some of these situations have happened without drama. So what happened in 2014, you now had Ebola in a part of the world that had never seen Ebola before. You had a, Ebola in a part of the world that up until very recently was in turmoil with civil unrest, civil war, genocide. I mean, everything was going on in these areas. You have an area where people were moving to the cities and going back and forth to their villages. The irony is now that the unrest was over, they built roads, they improved the infrastructure. So it's much easier for people to travel around. So you're now having a lot of mixing of people and exposure that wouldn't have occurred before in an environment where they had very little infrastructure. I think in, in Liberia, there's one physician for every 120,000 people. You just don't have a doctor. Nobody has primary care. You think it's hard to get in primary care here. It must be unbelievable in Liberia. But you know, that's just to make the point that you know, the, the, this is a part of the world where they're struggling. And this is why this is so devastating in that part of the world. That's where the problem is. If we took all the resources we were using for Ebola response in this country and somehow channeled that to the actual Ebola response, it probably would be over now. But you know, the, unfortunately, there is a good response now, but unfortunately, it was, it was delayed. And, and fam whenever somebody dies, families get together and they have a funeral. You know, right. those are very important to people in mourning. So infection control is avoiding blood and body fluids. What I tell the police is stay six feet away. It's better than protective, personal protective equipment. Because you get closer with personal protective equipment, that can get, become contaminated. You can take it off and get exposed. But if you're six feet away from somebody, you're not going to come in contact with their blood and body fluids. And that's sort of the basis for our response, that we have a limited number of people getting into PPE. Only the people are actually going to get close within three feet of the patients. And this is Ebola care in Africa. And this was developed, this is before this year, this was developed by experience. of Because in most of these out outbreaks, in the first half of the outbreak, more than half of the people with Ebola were healthcare workers trying to take care of Ebola patients. Either, either recognized Ebola patients or so early on that they didn't even realize that the people had Ebola. Once infection control like this is established, then those infection rates in the healthcare workers dropped. They didn't drop to zero, but they dropped by many fold. All right, where does Ebola come from? Well, it turns out 
this is a fruit bat. There are many, many different, different um, species of fruit bat. I'm not even sure this one's a pro. If anybody's a fruit bat expert in the room, I apologize because this is just a generic fruit bat. But these fruit bats occur all over Central Africa, West Africa, into the Indies, into uh, South Asia, out into Polynesia. And uh, there are many different species. And they roost like this. This is actually a picture from Liberia that Dr. Pavlin took. And this is them roosting in a water tower. And they're fruit eaters. They're not vampires. They don't bite people. And they occur, as I said, in the distribution within this line. So they're very, they're very prevalent. And the, the colors represent areas where there's some kind of Ebola virus. So you can see there's, there's a close overlap, except for the imported cases in Europe and North America. And this is what's thought to happen. It's not thought that the bats themselves account for the cases, but that the bats infect wild animals. And these wild animals are the source for people. And how do people come in contact with wild animals? Mostly they don't live animals, but they do come in contact with dead animals in terms of bush meat. This is a big problem in Africa because with the growth in the population, um, poverty, people, and, and the fact that these are delicacies, people pay good money to buy wild animal meat, especially primate meat, monkeys and apes. And this is part of the endangered species status of some of these animals because people eat them. And they eat them as very special foods. So it does happen. And this is, this is uh, Monrovia in Liberia. This is the way it looks. And so people are living in very abject conditions, very close together with poor sanitation. They're going back and forth to their home villages, bringing things with them back and forth, going to funerals in their home village or in Monrovia, being potentially exposed to Ebola. And there are these bushmeat markets in the city, so they import this food. Again, illegal, the governments try to close them down, but they flourish because this is very special for people. And this meat can be contaminated with Ebola virus and be the source. So what was the source? You know, it's amazing now between molecular epidemiology, fingerprinting viruses, and just traditional epidemiology. We actually know the first case in West Africa was a two-year-old. And what happened, this kid lived in this Meliandu, small community, a few hundred people lived with his family, that, whose picture you saw. And um, near the house, he was playing in the yard. Well, it was not even a yard. He was just out playing. There was a tree that had a burned out core. And in that burned out core, there were nesting, I guess you could say nesting, roosting, roosting bats, fruit bats were roosting in the tree. And it's thought that he played in this very tree. And that he became exposed to Ebola. He had this terrible illness. There are a lot of terrible illnesses. You know, every day that somebody gets Ebola in Africa, several hundred people get malaria and die. Several hundred people get HIV. Several hundred, or die from HIV. Several hundred people die of tuberculosis. So many, many more people die of these other diseases. So he got very sick. Could have been anything. He died. The family came from all over. It was a tragedy. It was a two-year-old. They had this funeral rite. They all went back to their homes. The family starts dying of Ebola. The village starts dying of Ebola. One thing leads to another. And then by April, that was in December, by March it was recognized that there was an outbreak. There was probably a lot of denial in these countries. It never happened before. We haven't seen this before. There was a lot of apathy in the world. The only responders were Doctors Without Borders, and they said, this is unprecedented. We better do something about this. I think their press release was on March 23rd. But so it wasn't long before the, it spilled over from Meliandu in Guinea to Sierra Leone and Liberia. And then 
it took off. He got to the cities. So it was unprecedented in April because it was over 200 cases in a place that had never seen Ebola before. And then after April, it was unprecedented because it was spreading to three countries with large urban populations. And it was occurring in cities like Conakry and Monrovia and Freetown. Th you know, these were backwaters 50 years ago. Now they have millions of people. They're major centers. So, and because the civil unrest, a lot of people are moving, is over, a lot of people move to the cities. But there's no going back now, it did happen. And this is the latest case counts. And you can see in Sierra Leone, it's still going up. In Liberia and Guinea, it seems to be leveling off. Not going away, but at least leveling off. And there, there's now some of these Ebola hospitals have empty beds. That's an indicator that things are getting better. But things are not getting better in Sierra Leone. And this is the latest case, case count, there's 20,000. 8,000 deaths. We're probably not counting all of the cases or all of the deaths. This is the latest map. You can still see it's widespread. Some areas still fairly intensive. There were eight cases in Mali. There were 20 cases in Nigeria. There were two cases in, two cases in Senegal. So there's been some spillover, but not widespread transmission. Mali is off the list of risk countries now. And this is the sort of the state-of-the-art care currently, or was, in, uh, maybe not currently, but was uh, in, these, in these hospitals. This is now getting better. This is better. You can see still very primitive care sites. The interesting aspects here, you can see these people are all, all in their protective suits, and this guy has the chlorine spray. And this is the sick person, but who is this? It's somebody who survived and is now working in the hospital. Many of these people can't go back to their home because they're stigmatized as having Ebola. So now they're helping out because they're immune to Ebola. And this woman is probably not immune. She just probably knows that she's far enough away that she's safe. And this is, again, this example of the Ebola hospital. This is a child who is being watched because he had fever, he could have had malaria, he could have had typhoid, he could have had a variety of things, and his test came back positive. So he's now being transferred to the actual Ebola ward. He was in an isolation room by himself for several days, waiting for his lab test. Now, now he's being this is being transferred to the Ebola. I think this is very compelling. This is how people are trying to deal with this. These are people getting sprayed down with chlorine. When you talk to the people who come back to delivering care, they say all their, what their, their strongest memory is when the, beyond the patients and the deaths and so forth, is the gut memory is sweat and chlorine because they're wearing impermeable suits. That means fluids can't get in, but it also means fluids can't get out. And high humidity, high temperature environments. So they're soaking wet in these suits the minute they put them on. And then they work for several hours in those conditions. And this is how they recycle their protective equipment, sprayed and, and in the sun. And this is now how they bury bodies because of the risk. The body is just a container of virus and the body fluids are all highly infectious. So. But you can see they're burying them in shallow, shallow graves. And this is the way it's done in these Ebola outbreaks. And nobody gets Ebola because they buried people in shallow graves. We're having trouble sort of having people come to the grips that if somebody died of Ebola, we would want them buried. There's no reason not to bury them. This is a cemetery that a friend of mine took of a hospital, outside a hospital she was working at for a month. These are people who died while she was working while she was working there. And this is what's being built, these temporary sites. So they have one tenth with subdivisions for the people who have fever. You don't know if they have Ebola or not, but you don't want to put them all together because some of them have Ebola and some of them don't. So keeping them separate is important. But then once they have Ebola, they can go in an open ward because everybody else has Ebola. So that's sort of the way they're designing these. And this, 
This gives you an idea on how well you can see it. They have the suspect cases with, with closed rooms and then the open wards for the confirmed cases and they just move people across. Early on, they were just putting everybody together, which actually increased transmission. You, you hear people didn't want to go to the hospital because they were worried about getting Ebola. That actually was not totally irrational early on. So what happened in this outbreak? On December 2nd, it's estimated that child was exposed. The child died. Over the rest of December, beginning of January, the rest of the family died. And then it spilled from Guinea into these other countries on March 23rd, when there were 86 cases and 59 deaths in Guinea. And now there were some cases in the other countries. MSF um, put out an international alert. It wasn't really responded to. In March, there was more spillover. Then there was exponential growth of the epidemic. And it wasn't until August 8th that it was declared a, a, an outbreak of international significance. And what that means is, up until then, to go into that country to deliver care, you'd have to be invited. Unless you were doctors without borders. They just don't care. They just go. And you know they take the consequences. But officially, you need to be invited. And they weren't inviting. They thought, you know, it wasn't so bad. We can take care of it. But they all signed a treaty back in 2005 that says if something like this happens, we all agree we have to let in the international community. So that's when WHO, CDC, the European Union could go in and start building these hospitals and caring for people. So it never occurred there before. The systems were dysfunctional still. High population mobility, dense population. This is what I was talking about in terms of emerging infections. This is exactly that scenario. All of these things coming together to cause this major outbreak. Oh, and actually, here's, here's healthcare spending per person. So they spend 100 times less per person for healthcare in Sierra Leone than they do in the United States. So that is the that is the resource available. And this is what I was talking about. In the initial time period until the international outbreak was declared for the outbreak, while it was occurring, for every four cases of Ebola, there are four deaths. There were 110 deaths from tuberculosis, 404 from just diarrhea, 552 from malaria, and um, HIV AIDS, 685 in that same area. So you can see, as bad as this is, it's in a setting where there's a lot of bad things that happen to people, unfortunately. If you, if you look at an out, uh, this is a typical Ebola outbreak in Uganda where they have a response system in place. And you can see from the onset to the end, it's just a matter of two or three months because they get people in there they change the funeral rites. They convince people not to do that. They isolate people. They go find people who are exposed and isolate them from the initial symptoms. And that's what you have to do, case finding and isolation of cases. That's how you control Ebola. And that's why we would never have an Ebola outbreak spread in the United States, because we're capable of doing that. But imagine in the conditions. And another thing we learned is that our initial CDC guidance here. You know, this is like one of the, spot the differences, you know, in those magazine things, spot the differences between these two pictures. The bottom line is the guy on the right is completely covered. The guy on the left has bare neck and bare legs. So there's an opportunity for contamination. Especially with these very sick patients, you can imagine what it must be like trying to take care of them with the vomiting, the diarrhea, the bleeding. It's just horrendous. They're weak. And they can't take care of themselves. And, and since October 27th, everybody coming back from those countries has been classified in three categories. High risk, well, there's, there's only been one of those. That's somebody who actually was known to have been exposed to Ebola. And then some risk means you were taking care of Ebola patients, you were in contact with people with Ebola, but you were protected by personal protective equipment, essentially. Those are the some risk people. And then the low but not zero risk, although for many people it is zero, is you're just in that country. And it's not enough to be in that country, you have to be exposed to Ebola. It's not casual contact, 
It's not contact with people who are asymptomatic. You have to be in direct contact with somebody who's sick. And if you go to that country, let's say on a business trip, and you stay in a hotel, and you know you're never exposed to anybody who's sick, you really don't have a risk for Ebola. But we are monitoring everybody. That the high-risk people are quarantined. You heard about that guy who went to Nebraska to be really quarantined in that unit. Uh, and the some-risk people are restricted. They can't go back to health care. They can't go into a crowd. They couldn't come to this tonight. They could listen to it on television, probably. They, um, so there's restrictions. Now, as long as they're asymptomatic, there's no problem with them. I have no problem with them. Should, nobody should have a problem with them. And we're monitoring every day, and they call us if they develop fever. Now, people do get sick. So far, it hasn't been Ebola. But there have been several malaria cases in these individuals. There have been colds and probably flu. But you know, you talk to them. They're not really having symptoms of Ebola. We do know enough about Ebola to differentiate that. And the other thing we discovered is people have a very poor idea of geography. So they're actually, somebody told me about a nursing home that was actually keeping people out of work for 21 days after they came from back from Kenya. Like that makes absolutely no sense at all. Nairobi is probably as far from Monrovia as Miami, uh, and probably harder to get to than Miami. So I just want to point out that Africa is huge. The only reason why we don't think of it as huge because we grew up with the Mercator projection, you know, that makes, the, makes Greenland look bigger than Africa. Greenland's tiny compared to Africa. They should put Greenland on here just to make that point. And most of Africa does not have Ebola. So it's a very small part of Africa. So we must keep telling the public that it's this, these three countries, and if people didn't have exposure to Ebola, they're not going to get Ebola. That's where I want to stop with Ebola. I want to talk about a couple of other diseases much more briefly. But any questions about specifically about Ebola? We'll have time after, I'm sure, too. I'm not going to take the first. We don't, we, technically, we don't know. We assume because the antibodies from such a person seems to help people with Ebola. And there's no recorded case of somebody getting Ebola twice. But that would have to be a very unlucky person to be exposed to Ebola twice. So we think, and many times, the people who have recovered from Ebola are working in the Ebola hospitals. And they're not necessarily using PPE. Now, their, expo their exposure was to the kind of Ebola virus that they were actually taking care of. So if, it's possible if they went to another part of Africa and there was a different strain of Ebola, they may be actually at risk. So Dr. Sacre, as you heard yesterday, is taking all the precautions anyway. But the question is going to be, what will CDC classify him as when he comes back? I suspect it's going to be low but not zero risk. But we don't know. We're waiting to see. We're happy with him going back to work as long as he's had no exposure. All right, another disease. Remember SARS? I don't know if I came to Westford to talk about SARS a long time ago. I probably did, didn't I? So um, SARS happened in 2003. It, it emerged in Asia. It spilled over to the rest of the world through Hong Kong. Hotel Metropole, a, a physician from China, was from mainland, was staying there. Uh, he had it. A bunch of people got it. They flew back to their home countries, Toronto, Hanoi, Vancouver, Frankfurt, Ireland, etc. And that's how, again, because they could be exposed and within five days be on the other side of the world, that's why SARS was able to travel, because the incubation period was long, five days or longer. So five days, you can be a lot of places in five days. And it was, uh, the travel made this possible. And you remember, everybody got really excited. People, people stopped going to Chinese restaurants, which made absolutely no sense whatsoever. And it was tracked down to, first of all, the masked palm civet, which was this animal in the live animal markets in China. Again. These were animals that, when they were in their ancestral village, were delicacies. These animals don't hang out in cities. So 
people would catch them in the countryside and bring them, just like those bushmeat markets in Africa, these live animal markets provide the opportunity for exposure. And think about avian influenza, uh, another zoonotic virus that the live poultry markets can sustain and expose people to in the cities. And ultimately, it was tracked back to a fruit bat. So the SARS coronavirus is felt to have originated in fruit bats. And the fruit bats infected the wild animals who wound up in the wild animal markets. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Wild animal markets and people, the initial cases, then it could spread from person to person, not very, fortunately, not as effectively as many other viruses. But the index cases, the source cases, seem to have been exposed to animals who were exposed to bats. And this is the coronavirus, it's called coronavirus because it has, looks like the sun. It has these little projections off the surface. It's not really this color. It's probably no color, actually, but they wanted to make it look like the sun. And we now have Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is another coronavirus related to but different from the SARS virus, first identified in 2013, primarily in wealthy Saudi Arabians and Emirate people flying to Europe for health care and flying to places where they had this very advanced virology and could identify this new virus. And then studies done in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and those kinds of places found that there were these outbreaks of MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus. So big concern because people can travel. You remember in May, we sort of got um, <coughs> distracted by Ebola, but in May we were worried about MERS. There were two cases in the United States, and they were worried about, there was no transmission in the United States, but there were two important cases. Again, they were people who were in Arabia, got to the United States, felt fine, got sick when they got here, and had MERS. And the outbreak continues. We don't hear much about it, but it's continued into 2014. It's sort of seasonal. There was a big concern in September, October with the Hajj when, when um, Muslims go to, you know, every Muslim should strive to go to Mecca in their lifetime. And so people do that at a certain time of year. There's a, the Hajj. They can go actually at other times of the year, the Umrah as well. But uh, three million people go to Mecca for the Hajj or two, for two weeks. So there's a lot of potential for exposure. So far, the Saudi government does this incredible job of screening and having people available and doing all this infection control. And there haven't been outbreaks since MERS emerged. But there have been transportation of the virus to Europe and to North America now because the fact that people can be exposed or because the fact cases occurred in relatively well-to-do people could afford to be airlifted to European hospitals. The incubation period is about 12 days, similar to SARS, maybe a little longer. Fever, cough, weakness, fatigue, just like with SARS, pneumonia, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And uh, many cases is gastrointestinal involvement too. And that's tr that was true with SARS. It took a while to appreciate that, but people had diarrhea and the virus was probably in the diarrhea as well. And MERS comes from bats as well. And we know that because the bats have antibodies to the virus, very specific antibodies. So they, they seem not to get sick with it. <coughs> they seem to just get the virus and get better. At least they're not complaining, as far as we can tell. And we don't think it's the bats, but other animals like camels. One of the characteristics of the people who have had MERS is many, almost most of them, well, most of them, almost all of them, have had some kind of camel, direct camel exposure. Or they were exposed to somebody who was known to have MERS. That's the two ways that people seem to get it. Like this guy racing his camels, probably not his camels, he's just racing them. And it turns out the camels that the veterinarians describe this illness this cold that camels get, and it turns out the camels get this 
MERS virus is a cold. And it's probably been going on for 50 years. But it's taken 50 years for the virus to change enough to spill over into people. Or it's been happening for 50 years and we just didn't know about it. But I think more likely is that the virus is evolving from an animal source to humans. And that's, that's where people have gotten this MERS virus. So again, it's that same situation. Like with Ebola, it's the bats giving it to animals that come in contact with people. Probably occasionally the bats, like that poor child in Guinea back in December. But primarily from uh, environmental and other animal exposure. And this just gives you an idea of the crowds in the Hajj. I mean, it's like, I mean, there was concern that people would come from West Africa for the Hajj and would be incubating Ebola. Fortunately, that didn't happen. They really do have an, an incredible crowd control and uh, health care screening program in Arabia. So the bottom line here is that the infections I've talked about, a lot of other infections, are animal infections. Animal viruses, in this case, that spill over into people. And the whole influenza, I'm not going to talk about influenza specifically because of time, but inf influenza is a good example of that. Influenza A, the, the avian swine flu, the animal spillovers of these viruses that now have limited exposure. And then there are two other viruses, Hendra and Nipah, that cause a severe measles-like illness that have al al always already been tracked to fruit bats. And it turns out we now think that the rabies virus ultimately, once upon a time, was a bat virus that evolved to infect other species. So these fruit bats have a lot to answer for. <laughs> Although they say they say they 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 taste good, <laughs> like chicken. I like chicken. I just want to remind people that what people die of in this country is like influenza and other common diseases. So as exotic as these are, as concerned as we are about travelers being exposed, these are not diseases that are transmitted in the United States and cause any significant morbidity, mortality in terms of numbers of cases. And another virus that was sort of submerged a little bit by the Ebola outbreak was enterovirus D68, remember that? And I think the people, people got the impression that it was a virus that caused severe illness in children, respiratory illness. And that's true, but that's, not, that's only part of the story. It was a virus that caused illness in probably millions of people, among whom were children at risk for asthma exacerbation. So, I, you know, people sort of got, you know, they kept asking me how many cases we had. You know, probably tens of thousands, you know. They were talking about these individual kids with severe illness. Fortunately, most of them got better within 24 to 48 hours with good management. But those, that was just the tip of the iceberg. The real cases were people who didn't even know they had enterovirus D68. I think I had it. I got sick just when we said we're not testing anybody unless they're at high risk. So I didn't actually get tested. I probably should have. It would have been a good case study. But I had a respiratory illness around the same time. A lot of people were sick. And I had this persistent cough and respiratory irritation for several weeks. Anybody else had something similar in the fall? It was probably enterovirus D, D68. <coughs> and these viruses also cause hand, foot, and mouth, which I think we've had cases this fall as well, some of which were probably due to enterovirus D68. Uh, remember back a couple of years ago, we had A6. There was a whole outbreak of hand, foot, and mouth disease. And these viruses, these enteroviruses, there were over 100 of them, Coxsackie viruses, echoviruses, enteroviruses, they're all the same. It's the same family that the polio viruses are in. It's the same family that hepatitis A is in. These are small, round viruses that, unlike Ebola, are very hardy in the environment. So they're easily transmitted by surfaces. So disinfection becomes very important with these viruses. And Hand hygiene, hand washing becomes particularly important with these viruses. And they're 
in the in the respiratory secretions and they're in the fecal matter and that's how they're transmitted. And there are outbreaks, lots of outbreaks in daycare settings of enteroviruses. And this year it was enterovirus D68. And all of the enteroviruses can cause all of these syndromes. And especially aseptic meningitis. You know, when people get viral meningitis, usually in the summer and the fall, and they get better in a few days. It's not like bacterial meningitis, it's dangerous. And uh, that's, these are the viruses that cause that as well. And we saw a few cases of that during this time period. But more important, all of these viruses can cause disease similar to that caused by the related polio viruses. So there are three vi polio viruses which cause gastroenteritis, they cause a gastrointestinal illness, and in one in a hundred to one in a thousand people who get them cause paralysis. So again, the paralysis is the tip of the iceberg of infection. That's why polio viruses spread so widely, not because they're spreading particularly from the people who have paralysis. In fact, they're paralyzed, they're not outspreading. It's spread by the people who have minor illness with these viruses to other people. Um, and we, we've had this outbreak of this polio-like, uh, it's called acute flaccid paralysis that came right after D68. And we know that D68 type viruses can cause this. Do we know that D68 caused this? Unfortunately, no. Because by the time you get the paralysis, the signs of the infection are gone. So right now, the CDC is trying to do a study where they're looking at evidence of infection in, in kids who had the paralysis versus kids who didn't have the paralysis to see if the kids with the paralysis are more likely. Unfortunately, I think what they're going to find is that a lot of people had D68. It's going to be hard to differentiate. It's hard to find the virus. Although, in two cases now, the virus was actually found in the spinal fluid of people with the paralysis. Again, proof of concept that it could be the cause of this outbreak of paralysis, which was much scarier than the actual disease that we knew about that was caused by D68. And this sort of happened right around the time Ebola emerged as an issue. So I think people sort of ignored this. Fortunately, the cases have dropped off and the studies are ongoing. What happens is the virus invades the spinal cord and causes the nerve to die, the nerve to the muscle to die. This is what happens in polio. And then the muscle deteriorates without the nerve supplying it. And, that's, and that can be very asymmetrical. It can affect one limb, four limbs. It can affect the breathing muscles, it can affect the facial muscles, the throat muscle, any, any muscles in the body. And the way to prevent it is traditional viral disease prevention. Hand washing, contact, stay home when you're sick to avoid transmitting it. The last disease I'm going to talk about was the disease we thought would be the big disease of 2014. That I think I've probably spoken of here before too and that's chikungunya, which I know sounds like a menu item in, a, in an Indian restaurant, but is a virus. And this is Aedes aegypti. This is the virus that transmits yellow fever, dengue, those kinds of illnesses. But this is Aedes albopictus, the tiger mosquito, the Asian tiger mosquito, that because of international commerce has spread all over the world. And we know that's how it travels. It travels with travelers, and more importantly, it travels on cargo ships in the water. You know, it's reproducing on the ships and biting the crew or whatever livestock's being transported on those ship, ships. So now, Aedes albopictus is widely distributed in South America and now in North America. In Aedes aegypti, which almost was completely eliminated with DDT in the 1950s and 60s, has come back. Because the advantage of DDT was it was, very, it was very potent, at least as long as the mosquitoes remain susceptible to it, and it had a residual effect. So you put it on a surface, and for months, any mosquito that landed on that surface would die. Now, now we have very good pesticides 
but they don't last on the surface because we don't want them to last on the surface because we don't want them to get into the food chain and affect us. And the first day, you know, we talk about chikungunya, but a very serious problem in Latin America and in the Caribbean is dengue fever. People come back from trips now with dengue fever. Dengue fever is called breakbone fever because you have very severe muscle, muscle pains. And, and some people can cause a hemorrhagic fever that doesn't look all that different from Ebola when it's hemorrhagic. So cause severe disease is a very severe illness. It's becoming much more common. There are four types of dengue virus that used to be isolated. Now they occur all over the world. So in other words, there are certain kinds of dengue virus. One kind of dengue virus occurred here. One kind of dengue virus occurred here. Another kind of dengue virus occurred in southern Asia. So there were different dengue viruses. Now they occur. And if you get sequential infection with dengue viruses, your risk of the hemorrhagic consequences increases. So the first case of dengue is unlikely to be hemorrhagic, but is likely to be very uncomfortable. But the second case could very well be hemorrhagic because you can get all four dengue viruses even. You can get all four. This is the distribution of dengue now. And you can see very close to our shores, Puerto Rico has had tens of thousands of cases. In fact, they stopped collecting blood now during the dengue season in Puerto Rico because they're concerned about people having the virus in their blood. And this is the dengue at risk area in the dengue vulnerability. And this is not about Aedes aegypti, which is actually the most successful vector, but it also deals with Aedes albopictus, which is spreading and can transmit dengue as well. Not as effectively as, as uh, Aedes aegypti, though, probably. So chikungunya is an African word that means bent over in pain. And that's what happens. You get bit by a mosquito, and a few days later, the incubation period, you develop severe joint pains. And these severe joint pains can last a week, two weeks, three weeks. And some people, even longer. And you get a rash, and you get a fever, and you feel terrible. And chikungunya is very successfully transmitted by Aedes albopictus, the tiger mosquito, which, as you can see, since 1980, has now spread to tropical and semi-tropical areas of the world, including to Massachusetts. We have Aedes albopictus in Massachusetts now. It's just starting to breed here, so it won't be long before we'll have to deal with it as a potential vector. And chikungunya, it's not West Nile virus, the infections in the birds, and we get it because the mosquitoes bite the birds. Triple E, eastern equine encephalitis, is a bird virus. And we get it rarely because the mosquito bites the bird and transmits the infection to people. Yellow fever, dengue, and chikungunya are human infections. The mosquito is transmitting it from one person to another. So somebody's walking around with chikungunya virus in their blood. Mosquito bites them. Mosquito bites you, you can get chikungunya. And you don't have to be in the Caribbean for that. It could be your neighbor coming home from Antigua with chikungunya, not knowing they have chikungunya. Oh, you know, I've been back a couple of days now. You really feel terrible. They feel terrible for a week or two. They don't know what they had. The mosquito, the albopictus that's now in Westford, bit them, can bite you. And I'm only saying that because I don't think that's going to happen a lot. But there's that potential there. In, in, um, in the Indian Ocean, in the last 15 years, there have been outbreaks on islands in the Indian Ocean because the virus was originally in Africa and South Asia, and then the mosquito with the 80s, 80s albopictus spread along the islands, around the islands of the Indian Ocean. And in some of those islands, the person-to-person -person mosquito transmission rate, illness rate, was 35%. That's almost unbelievable to me. That's a highly transmitted. And when they looked at the blood of people who had no symptoms, 85% of the people had, had evidence of past infection. So for every case, there was another case that had no symptoms. So that's an incredible transmission rate. And there, this, there was an outbreak in Tuscany in 2007. That would have been a nice outbreak to volunteer for. Um, because they have 80s albopictus and somebody came back from the Indian Ocean, 
and brought it to Tuscany. So it's epidemic polyarthritis. I already talked about a lot of this. Very rarely do people get like a little uh, bleeding rash. Uh, and there have been many, many imported cases in the United States, especially since it got to the Western Hemisphere in 2013. But there were cases before that, people coming back from Asia and Africa. And there have been cases all over. This is the kind of rash you sometimes see. This is the kind of rash you sometimes see with bacterial meningitis. So it's kind of worrisome when you see it. You have to rule out meningitis. And there have been many, because France, well, some of those islands are not colonies of France. They're integral parts of the French Republic. So people go back and forth constantly. So there have been a lot of imported cases. This is an old slide, maybe 10 years old by now. I've been using it for a long time. But you can see they are, they're also getting 80s albopictus in France. So with all of these people coming back from that part of the world and all of these mosquitoes, they could have a Tuscan experience in France. So this is where chikungunya is now. This map did not include the Western Hemisphere prior to 2013. So we've had massive outbreaks in, in the Caribbean. This is the distribution now. There were 11 transmitted cases documented in Florida last year, last year, the year before. And it's swept across the Caribbean, uh, now in South America, where the dark colors is where there's actual transmission. There's been some spillover now from Mexico. It's a big, it's a big problem. The good news is it's had such a high attack rate and it looks like people are immune once they get it. So if everybody gets it, then nobody can get it. Or, or there could be a vaccine. People are working on a vaccine. It's probably better than everybody getting it. So th this is an old slide too. It goes only to August. There are now over a million cases. Those are the ones that get reported. Can you imagine? That can't be all of them for sure. So it's probably a small proportion. This is the latest number. There were 2,010 2 travel associated cases so far in, in 2014 with 11 locally acquired cases. It was last year they were locally acquired. And this is what you might see when you're traveling to warn you. Now, unlike the mosquitoes we warn you about here, these mosquitoes are active all day long. So it's not just dusk, dusk and dawn. So you really have to be careful. And that has implications. We get 80s elbow pictus. It, if it's hot enough, they'll bite all day long. Let me just end with one emerging, re-emerging infection that I don't think is getting enough attention. And that is hepatitis C. Now we know the baby boomers were exposed to hepatitis C in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s. A lot of people were exposed, probably three to five million people have the infection, and we're, there's now a recommendation to test. Everybody born between 1945 and 1965 should be tested for hepatitis C at least once. How many people in the audience knew that? So there, there are some of you that are in that age group. When you go to your doctor, they're supposed to ask you, have you been tested for hepatitis C lately? Ever, ever, sorry, ever. Um, because when, when it was done on the basis of risk, a lot of people don't even realize their risk for hepatitis C. It could be injection drug use, it could be sharing needle, it could be blood transfusion, it could be blood exposure, a razor blade. There's a whole bunch of ways. And, and by doing it by risk, they weren't identifying people. And, and now there's a relatively easy cure of eight to 12 weeks of oral medication. Of course, it costs $120,000, but the fact is it can cure you of hepatitis C without injections, without going for a year, without many side effects. So, you know, there's a, a new age. So the, there's a lot of, uh, the manufacturers of these drugs have a vested interest in getting everybody tested to get treated. And that's a good thing, but the focus has really been on the baby booms. And what we've noticed in, in Massachusetts and is now being noticed elsewhere, probably we noticed it first because we have very good surveillance for hepatitis C is now we're having an outbreak in people under 30. You see, this is the distribution of cases, the baby boomers. And in, in 2012, it should have looked like this. Everybody should have been 10 years older. But what we've seen is an even bigger 
bump in people under 30. And unlike the baby boomer generation where there were 60% were women, 40, 60% were men, 40% were women, in this younger age group it's more like 50-50. In fact, there's a female predominance in the younger age group. And which because this female, these females in the younger age group are now getting hepatitis C, we're seeing babies born with hepatitis C. This is huge. This is a huge outbreak. And what's driving it? Injection drug use. Just like the drug overdoses, heroin use. This, you know, the drug overdoses are horrible indicators of injection drug use. But they're indicators of a small proportion of that drug use. It's too big, one, one is too big, but the fact is we're now seeing or counting over 2,000 new hepatitis C cases in people under 30 every year. We estimated back in 1999 that there were 110,000 people in Massachusetts with hepatitis C. We've already counted 120,000. And we know that most of the baby boomers haven't been tested yet. And people are still getting hepatitis C, the younger group. So we're upping the estimate to at least 200,000. 200,000 people with hepatitis C. And you can cure them with treatment. So you can cure them so they'll never develop the liver failure, the cirrhosis, the liver cancer. In fact, if you treated them now, you could see an effect within five years in terms of the complications of the liver disease. There's some nice studies that show that now. So we would want to treat those people. Do the math, 200,000 times 100,000 each. That's bigger than the state budget. So this is a challenge, and somehow we have to figure out how to do this. Because if we don't treat them, at least the younger people are going to still be transmitting the infection. We'll get more cases. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. To cure, it's a combination of drugs. Now two or three drugs given orally. They're just recently released, and some of them are still on the way out, coming out. And the evidence is that 12 weeks definitely work for most of these combinations and give you a cure rate over 90% conservatively. And um, there's now, uh, there are now studies looking at six weeks and eight weeks. And some of the eight-week studies now have documented very high rates of response. So these look very good. It used to be most people needed a year of once-a-week injections of interferon with ribavirin. The interferon made people sick. The ribavirin made them anemic. These drugs don't seem to have those same effects, plus you're only getting them for two to three months. So like HIV, the difficulty with HIV is that your immune response may not be sufficient. Now, people are studying monoclonal antibodies. They're studying antibodies against specific parts of the virus that seem to be protective. If they could figure out a vaccine that would make you make that antibody, it might be a preventive vaccine. The other thing we know is you can get reinfected with hepatitis C. You can clear you can clear the virus, and probably up to 50% of people do clear the virus with infection, but then you can become reinfected. But on reinfection, your likelihood of clearing the virus is actually higher. So there must be some protection that someday people could figure out how to elicit. Yeah, in fact, sometimes we have had to change the way we do follow-up. In fact, most local health departments aren't doing follow-up now because the problem is we actually would find out before the physician would find out and sometimes be the, per, be the people breaking the news to the patient. And we didn't think that was a good thing to do because the clinician, you know, before we had treatment, before we really understood this, people said, well, there's nothing you can do. Why worry about it? A lot of people will live their life and never know they have it, which was probably true for most people. So they would wait till like the next year when the person came back for their visit. We don't do that now because we're concerned about transmission and we're also concerned about 
people getting treated early before they have the end stage complications. But it looks like even people with cirrhosis can benefit from treatment. It can, it can, it won't reverse existing damage, but it'll slow or prevent further damage. So we really think treatment is the way to go. And unfortunately, the way it's currently priced is very problematic. So the, the question is, you only have seven minutes with the doctor, and actually seven minutes is the calculated time that a patient has with a physician. Um, you only have seven minutes, but how much can you do in seven minutes? Somebody actually did a study. They went through the Preventive Services Task Force recommendations, which is what the, uh, what the Accountable Care Act uses for deciding what they'll pay for. And they looked at all the prevention recommendations, all the tests, all the counseling, all the explanations that go with the testing. And they calculated that if they did everything on one visit, it would take seven hours. That's incredible. So what you need, you have to have systems in place. This is the whole idea of accountable care, that, that somehow this would be incorporated in an interaction with the health, your health care provider, and that provider would be a team and you know, sometimes you would get an email from the nurse saying, you know, these are certain things. If you, if you have a chance, let us know. We'll arrange for you to get these tests. Or they'll send you something about, you know, breast cancer screening or something about prostate screening. And so rather than put it all on the nurse practitioner or the physician or even the office staff during a visit, it'll somehow be incorporated into like an ongoing relationship could happen. It, it would be ideal if it did. But it would probably take that to really do all these things right. And, and I think you, you as the consumer have to decide what you're concerned about, what your family history is, what you, you know. 50 years ago, did you experiment injecting drugs when you were in college, you know, once? And I, and I have friends who literally have hepatitis C, and literally, they were at a party once, and everybody was injecting. They thought they'd try it. It was awful. They never did it again, and they wound up with hepatitis C. Yes, so the baby boomers is defined as anybody born between 1945 and 1965. Because that's where... 70% of the baby boomer hepatitis C cases, or 70% of hepatitis C cases were in that population. And, and very few of them were identified. So they decided, it used to be, you, you talk to somebody, did you ever get transfusions, did you ever get inject drugs, did you ever do this, did you ever do that? And that wasn't good enough. Either, either people didn't remember, or they didn't associate what they were being asked, or they weren't paying attention, or they didn't want to say, they didn't want to say that they did those things. Okay, I think, is there no other questions or comments? Yes. Okay, so the question is, if people coming back from parts of Africa where Ebola is occurring could have very subtle symptoms, how would we know? Fortunately, Ebola is not a subtle disease. So for example, when I sort of arrange for somebody to be seen, let's say someone comes back from Africa and they have a fever of 101, 102, it's happened. Yeah, and I talked to them and sort of established they really had no Ebola exposure. I really think they have malaria. All of them have had malaria so far. So malaria is very common, especially in people who are visiting family and friends, because they grew up with malaria. They, don't re they not hardly ever take the medication to prevent malaria. All of these healthcare workers who are going to deliver care or work on the response in Africa are taking medications to prevent malaria. We're not seeing it in them. We are seeing it in people. And most of those people have no exposure to Ebola. So they're uh, monitored. If they have fever, we make special arrangements for them to be seen in the hope that if they have malaria, that gets diagnosed. Because we don't want people dying of malaria because we're worried about Ebola. So that has happened. But so far, out of about 40,000 people, only one has developed Ebola. And that was Mr. Duncan. And he would have been considered that by any standard a high risk because he actually carried an Ebola patient, a sick patient, into the hospital. Um, presumably, that would have been elicited on the screen now, and he would have been considered at high risk. 
And as I said, the so far is only one person at high risk. Uh, and not, no one at some risk or low risk has developed Ebola. Does that mean it's not going to happen? No. I think the highest, the real risk is in the some risk people. People who are courageous and committed enough to go deliver care to people who need it and were accidentally exposed and didn't realize it. Those are the people I worry about. And we're actually not only monitoring their temperature, we're actually looking at them every day, visually. Not that I think that that's actually adding much, to tell you the truth, but uh, because you know, they're not, we're, you know, you're looking at them, they could become sick like after you leave. So I mean, just seeing them once a day doesn't really translate into me. I mean, unless we're gonna put them in like a big brother house and watch them all day long, but that doesn't make sense either. Oh, they get screened, they get their temperature taken, they get questioned, oh yeah. That's been going on long before we've been screening them on this side. And so if, if they're any way sick, they're not allowed to fly. So that, those people are screened out. And then they land and they get questioned by CDC personnel. CDC has been paralyzed for the last several months because everybody is doing, we can't get a lot of things done for other series, like hepatitis C. This was gonna be the year of getting it together on hepatitis C, but the hepatitis C people are working in Africa on Ebola, so that's not happening. There's a lot of other things that were supposed to have happened this year that haven't happened because of the response. Now the response is necessary, it would have been nice, would have been much easier to do in April probably, but unfortunately we don't have that option. So it's really become, and then when, they're, when they land here, we get all of their contact information, where they live, how to contact them. They're now, everybody's given a telephone that lasts for 30 days. I thought it was gonna last for 21 days. It was like, you know, 21 days in Pittsburgh. I guess they couldn't get that on a contract. So the phone lasts for 30 days. So there's no excuse like their phone doesn't work here. And um, we literally, and every time they travel, there's this complicated interstate notification that these people are traveling. And the, many of these people are essentially at no risk. It's not zero according to the CDC. But by my questioning, I can't see how they were exposed to Ebola. So, but we're treating them as if they were, could have been. So they're all being monitored. And if we really think they're at some risk, as I said, they're being monitored every single day in, in person or by Skype or FaceTime. And they're being restricted. They don't go to work and they um, can't go into crowds, as I said. And so there are restrictions. And, and unfortunately, it's meaning that a lot of people who would have volunteered to provide health care in Africa are not doing it now, not because they don't want to do it, but because they don't want to be out of work for three weeks when they get back. Whereas if they, if they do something that doesn't involve patient care, they're not restricted when they come back. They can go back to work, but they have to be monitored. No, not the low-risk people. All right, thank you.